All right, welcome to chapter 8 of Genesis. Um, I did not record for the Bible study, so I am just kind of giving you a recap of what we talked about here. Uh, the first three verses, it says, But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The waters receded steadily from the earth, at the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. A few things here, first of all, that God remembered. Now, it doesn't mean that he forgot, but that it brings forth action. It's kind of like if my wife has a birthday, I know her birthday is coming up on Friday, and when Friday comes, I remember it's her birthday, so I do something. It isn't because I forgot, it moves me to action. And anytime you see when it talks about God remembering, that's what it's talking about. He's being moved to action on your behalf. The other thing is, is we see that this wind that comes over the earth, that wind is the word ruach. It's the exact same word for spirit. The only way to determine whether it's wind or spirit is by the context. And the context here could be either one or both. And I think just like in Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit was, uh, the, the sound of rushing wind was there. Uh, you might have the same type of thing going here. But either way, I believe that the Spirit of God is involved. And one of the reasons I believe that is because of, um, you see that there's a parallel here between this and creation, because you've got the Spirit, the Ruach, that is drying up the waters. In other words, it's the Ruach that is over the waters. If you recall, that's how creation started, and this is also then how the flood is going to end. I'm going to show you some other parallels to that here coming up. Another thing is we see that the springs of the deep and the floodgates of heaven had been closed. This shows once more that the floodwaters weren't just rains coming down, but the floodwaters came from two sources. One being the waters above that God had put there are coming down, and two, the waters underneath were coming up. And so both of them are mentioned here a second time. Another thing we see is uh, talking about this parallel between creation and the flood. It is no question there. For example, we see the first day of creation, God separates light and darkness. What we see on the first day or the first thing that we see here is Noah is going to open a window to separate light and darkness and to, to kind of let the light in. The day two of creation, God separates waters. And what we see happening is that those waters that had been separated, the waters above and the waters below, are now being stopped and the rain stops. At day three, we see dry ground appears in creation. And that's what we see in the flood account. Day four is a little bit harder to see. And the scriptures don't say it outright, but uh, it could be perhaps just this, that on that time, now that that window is open, that uh, the rain has stopped, now you can see the sun, moon, and stars just like they were created on the fourth day. Then day five, we see is the creation of birds, and it's day five when God uh, or Noah sends out the raven and the dove. Day six, we see filling the earth with animals and man. Well, we see that the ark is then opened and the animals then are going to fill the earth once again. And right after that, we see that God commands them to be fruitful and multiply, just like we saw at creation. So that's the first six days of creation. And the seventh day, if you know the pattern continues, you ought to see rest, the Sabbath. Well, in a sense, we do see it because uh, though we don't see it in this chapter per se, we're going to see in chapter 9, verse 8, this account is going to be interrupted by the rainbow covenant. And what is this covenant? It's a promise of rest, ultimately. It's a promise that he's never going to bring judgment again. And so it says, And God said to Noah, I establish a covenant. Noah, his very name, means rest or comfort. And so even in his name, you see a Sabbath. And after all of this takes place, it's a, there's this covenant made with Noah, a covenant made with the Sabbath, you might say. Now that Sabbath is a picture of our heavenly reign with Christ in the future as well. So all of these things are fitting just perfectly. Um, like I said, beginning with the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, you might say. 
another aspect of this is right after Noah gets off this ark, what is he going to do? He's going to make sacrifices. Now, Adam and Eve may have made sacrifices after the fall. We don't know. The, the Bible doesn't say it. However, we do know that somehow Cain and Abel knew how to do these things. So it's pretty good to reason that Adam and Eve were making so some sort of sacrifice as well. We'll talk about that more in a minute, but um, just to see those parallels between the creation account and Noah's account is what I want you to see here right now. Another thing is, is I, I'm not going to show you all the chiastic structure here, but we've talked about chiasms before where <coughs> everything kind of meets in the middle. And so uh, you might have A, B, C, D, and here it's D, C, B, A, and it kind of meets in the center. Well, uh, what we see is that the earth is used seven times here so far, and and then you're going to see that the word covenant is going to appear seven times. Now, right smack dab in the center is going to be where God remembers. And what that's pointing to is that the chiastic structure, the center of it, the part that's being highlighted is God remembers. And that's really the most important part of this event is that God is now moving. He is about to act on behalf of his people. So verse 4 says, And on the seventeenth day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Why so specific? Why do we care what day Noah's Ark landed on Mount Ararat? Well, if there is something that seems so boring in Scripture and we don't, you know, really understand it, then the problem isn't with God or it isn't with Scripture. The problem is that we haven't put enough time in to understand it. And that it's there for a reason. And I think that there is a good reason that we see the 17th day of the seventh month uh, mentioned here. Let me show you the first one. First of all, we see that the Bible says Noah's Ark is going to rest uh, at this time. In other words, we're seeing that there is a deliverance for Noah on the 17th day of the seventh month. Now, the interesting thing is you're going to see then in Scripture, and I didn't put it up here, I should have, but we see that God is going to come and say this month is now to be the first month of your year. And so it seems that this month will become then later um, associated with the first month of the year. And so with that understanding, we see that the Red Sea is going to be parted on the exact same day. How do we know this? Well, we know that the Bible tells us Passover is always on the 14th day of the month. Well, if you look in the book of Numbers 33, verses 1 through 8, I'm not going to go through all of it here, but you will see that the Egyptians have the Passover meal, then the next day they leave, and it tells you they camp here, they camp here, they camp here, and then they cross the Red Sea. Counting those days, it's the third day after that, it's the 17th day of the month that they will then leave uh, Egypt by crossing the Red Sea. So they're delivered because Pharaoh's army is also going to be killed uh, at that time. So uh, it says here in Exodus 12, 14, This day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall keep it as a feast by an ordinance forever. And so we know that the Passover date is uh, always the same. And by the way, it is the same even when the Lord returns. If you read in Zechariah chapter 14 and other places, you will see that not only will Passover, but the Feast of Tabernacles be celebrated in the kingdom of God when he comes back. And so when he says that this is an ordinance forever, he meant it. We've been lied to in the idea that these are just Jewish things and they don't have any meaning to the church. No, it's all about Jesus. It's all about his sacrifice, and it is an ordinance that is to be kept forever. So uh, just important to kind of realize that we're not going to go through all the details of that today. But uh, the third thing is we see that the day they entered into Egypt will also be on this same day. How do we know that? Again, Exodus 12 says that it was 430 years. It came to pass at the end of that time to the same exact day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So basically telling us that if they entered Egypt on the same day that they left Egypt, they left, we just saw, on the 17th. 
Then they entered on the 17th to the exact same day. Now, why did they enter Egypt? Because they were being delivered from a famine. So another day of deliverance. The fourth one, uh, we see that they, they've been out in the wilderness for 40 years. They're entering into the promised land. And just before they do, they celebrate the Passover. Again, that's always on the 14th day of the month. On the 15th, it says they ate of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. So that's the 15th. So they're eating corn. Then it says on the 16th day, the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten the corn. All right, so that's now the 16th. And then after that, we see Joshua goes and there's going to be an angel of the Lord that appears before him. And he, he asks him, are you a friend or an enemy? And he says, uh, neither, but as a captain of the host of the Lord, I've now come. And this is in Joshua 5.13. What we see is this angel is going to tell them how they're supposed to conquer the promised land by you know, marching around Jericho. So in essence, the day that God told them what to do to defeat them at Jericho was the day that they were delivered going into the promised land. A fifth day of deliverance. 800 years later, after the kingdom of Israel has been divided, there's been a series of evil kings in Israel and in Judah. <coughs> Excuse me, and we see that Hezekiah becomes king, and <clears throat> there hasn't been a good king in a while. So what Hezekiah does is he they find the the law of God in the temple, and he realizes we haven't been following God, and so they cleanse the temple, and they are going to restore worship on the exact same day, on the seventeenth day, they restore worship, and again, really Israel is delivered because they are worshiping God once again. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles 29, verses 1 through 28. A sixth day of deliverance, we have Haman. It says human here, but it should be Haman is hung. In Esther 3, we see that there is an edict passed to kill all the Jews, and Esther hears about this, so she declares a fast for three days. Now, we know that the edict is on the 13th day of the month. There's a three-day fast that takes you to the 16th day of the month. And then we see the banquets that take place, making Haman get hung on the gallows on the 17th day of the month. And so the Jews were going to be wiped out, but here they are now delivered. A seventh one, and the most important is this. We know that Jesus Christ was crucified at Passover. Three days later, which would be the 17th of the month, he will rise from the dead, and we are all delivered. If you look at the odds of this happening, it is 1 in 78.3 quadrillion. So statistically, the odds of something happening, you know, important dates, all the bringing about deliverance on the exact same day uh, is remarkable. And so this is what we're seeing. So maybe that is why the scriptures are recording here that it was the 17th day of the seventh month that Noah's Ark landed on Ararat. Another thing is we see that in verses 5 and 6, the waters continued to recede until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark. Again, this probably has some spiritual meaning. For one thing, we're going to see it is going to help us understand when things are happening in the flood. Uh, maybe you can find some other spiritual reasons, but it's there for a reason. Uh, I do want you to understand this, that the ark is a picture of heaven. All right, it is that we talked about the door of the ark being a picture of Jesus. I am the door. Whoever comes to me will have eternal life. And you need to come through him. You needed to go through the door of the ark in order to be saved. This is a picture of salvation. It is a picture of heaven. And God is inviting us in. We also know that 40 is a day of testing, a time of, uh, you know, testing of man. And so after 40 days, Noah is going to open the window. I imagine that as the Tops of the mountains became visible. He is still continuing to be tested. Will you listen to me? Will you follow? I don't, I don't know. I just know that that is a number that is going to be throughout Scripture as testing. Verse 7 goes on and says that God, or Noah, sent out a raven, and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. Now, What's interesting is how this is worded. I believe it's the King James when it talks about this raven, that it kept flying back and forth. I think it's the King James that says, to and fro. Does that remind you of anybody? Somebody that goes about the earth to and fro? Yeah, Satan does. Uh, he roams about, looking whom he may devour. Yeah, he was called before, uh, the book of Job talks about going before God, and he says, where have you been? And he says, I've been on the earth going to and fro. 
And so ravens or birds really for the most part, especially the unclean ones, are a picture of demonic or uh, evil in the Bible time and time and time again all throughout the scriptures. Not the dove, but the unclean animals. And so I think that there is a picture here of ravens being unclean, raven being a picture of Satan, just as he was going to and fro on the earth in this chaotic uh, landscape that we have here. But then after that, we see a dove, a clean bird is sent out. And I think that that is a picture of the Holy Spirit, ultimately. So it says in verse 9, the dove could find no place to set its feet, because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah and the ark. Noah reached out his hand, took the dove, and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. And so, again, if the dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is Jesus, just another aspect of that triune part of God. Uh, again, we don't understand how all of that works, but nonetheless, that this is a picture of Jesus. And this dove, the Spirit, is sent out on the earth, but guess what? It can't find a place because it's unclean. You see, a raven is an unclean animal, and if it's like soggy, muddy, it'll land on that stuff. It'll land on a dead carcass floating in the water. But a dove isn't like that. A dove is clean. It doesn't like to get all dirty and things like that. So here is this dove. The, the, the raven doesn't come back, but the dove is going to come back. Why? Because there's no place to put her feet. Now, that kind of reminds us of something. First of all, in, in our New King James, it says it's, but in the Hebrew, it literally is her. And so this dove can't find any place for her feet because, well, the water is covering the surface of the earth. Do you remember in the New Testament, it says of Jesus that he could find no place to rest his foot because, uh, well, it really his head. He says there was no place to rest his head because uh, he came for a job and what he was so busy basically chasing demons, you might say. Well, so what happens when Jesus comes? He comes, he's going to find no place to rest his head. So what does he do? He is going to go back to his father, to the arms of his father. And here's what we see is, so it returned to Noah in the ark. And what happens? He reaches out his hand, he takes a dove, and brought it back to himself. These are words, the way it's worded, it, it seems to just scream Jesus being taken back to the Father and being seated at the right hand of God. Because he goes to himself where? In the ark. What's the ark a picture of? Heaven. So again, in verse 10, he waits seven more days and again sent out a dove from the ark. Now, Interesting thing is the first time the dove is sent out, like I said, no rest. Then he's taken back to the Father, and then after seven days or a period of completion, it will be sent back again. Now, it says, When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf, and no one knew that the water had receded from the earth. So, the next time this dove is sent out, what does he come back with? An olive leaf. An olive leaf is a picture of Israel throughout Scripture, uh, symbolically. So when Jesus comes back, he takes Israel, and he brings it back to the Father, in a sense. And what does he do? He keeps uh, this dove and the uh, olive leaf, Israel, in the ark, protected for another seven days, it says in verse 12. He waited seven more days and then sent out the dove again, but this time it did not return. So, you know, the, the scriptures talk about Israel being protected for a time, actually a seven-year period of time in some ways. Um, we read in Revelation how there was this uh, flood that goes after the woman and um, God opens up the earth to protect her, that kind of thing. This is the same type of picture we're seeing, is that maybe this is the, the tribulation period, and God is stepping in and protecting and, and uh, taking you to, to watch over you, but then it's going to send this dove back again. And what's that dove do? It doesn't come back because it now finds place to rest on the earth. When the Lord comes back a second time, we are going to see that he will indeed remain. The Spirit will remain on earth forever and ever and ever. And so kind of some neat patterns that are seen there. In verse 13, it says, By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth 
was completely dry. Now I'm going to cover some of that time here in just a second, but I want you to see just from a, rather than looking at just the spiritual end of things, the physical end is this. Today, Mount Ararat is about 17,000 feet. And the Bible says that after the ark lands on Ararat, Noah is going to wait two and a half months before the tops of the mountains can be seen above the water. After that two and a half months, there's another 40 days before he sends out a raven, which isn't going to come back. And then he sends out a dove, which returns. All right, He waits another seven days, sends out the dove, and this is the pattern that we are seeing. All in all, Noah and his family are going to spend 371 days in the ark. And so, uh, quite a trying time. Keep in mind that a year at that time is about 360 days because they have 30 days in their month, not like our 365. They use a lunar calendar. But anyway, we're going to see that before Noah opened the top covering to see dry ground for himself, it is going to be 29 more days. And then he's going to remain another 57 days after he opens the window before God invites him out. But he does not leave the ark until God says so, until he says, come on out of the ark. Now here is a graph showing you a little timeline of that. You might see here it says 377 days that Noah was inside the ark. That includes the seven extra days ultimately. And it's, some say 370, some say 371. It depends on how you're counting the days starting and so on. But bottom line is that extra seven days is all because he gets on the ark seven days before the flood actually comes, the, the fountains of the great deep break open. Now, another thing that we did talk about this is <clears throat> these mountains rising up. Were they really 17,000 feet at this time? Maybe, perhaps, we don't know. But I can tell you this, that the mountains weren't as high as they are today before Noah's flood. <clears throat> One of the reasons or uh, ways that God got rid of the flood waters is the mountains rose up and the valleys sank down using a type of plate tectonics or what we call um, the hydroplate theory that we looked at here before. And so as those mountains are rising up, the waters are rushing down and he sees the peaks of those mountains but the water is rushing down into the oceans. The mountains are continuing to rise. And then we are having an ice age that is also going to happen as a result of this. Um, we know that before Noah's flood, the waters were much warmer, uh, be tropical climate. Then when the fountains of the Great Deep are breaking open, you'd expect volcanoes, just like geology shows us. So magma creating even more hot water. So the, the air is going to be very moist. Now, we also know today scientifically that volcanoes cause colder climates. So, if you have colder climates being formed um, uh, because of all these gases in the atmosphere, that moist air is going to come down in snow and ice. Now, we do know uh, Tambora was a volcano that erupted in 1815 in Indonesia, and it caused two years without summer in America just because of this one volcano. So if one volcano can do that, a global catastrophe like this could certainly produce an ice age. And we estimate that ice age would last about five to 700 years, according to meteorologists and so on. And uh, keep in mind that the ice age never covered where Noah was at. It only came down a third of the way down the United States and then the other areas. So people and animals could live down beneath that and then as the Ice Age began to recede, then people would continue to move uh, north with that recession. So just to give you a little idea of what was going on there as well. Uh, verse 15 says, And God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Again, Noah didn't move until God told him to. Much like Jacob, Jacob doesn't move until God says you need to move. And I think that we could learn from that as well, that we shouldn't move until God says move. And I don't necessarily mean moving you know, from one state to another. I mean, that can be it. But in any direction of our life, any important decision, we need to be seeking God. In verse 17, it says, Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground, so that they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number upon it. There is that same pattern that we saw at creation. So Noah came out together with his son and his wife and his son's wives and all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on the earth came out of the ark, one kind after another. So again, um, critics have claimed that the earth would not be able to 
manage these animals and things like that after a global catastrophe like this. If you recall when we spoke on Mount St. Helens, that showed not to be the case, that actually the animals reproduced faster because of really what we call epigenetics, and also the ash and things like that it kind of was refreshing to the earth. It was a fertilizer. People in the Midwest paid to have the ash shipped to the Midwest for, for fertilizer. And so it's not going to be a devastating thing to the earth. It's actually going to be a reset, a type of new creation taking place here. Uh, verses 20 to the end, it says, And Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and the clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. So, first thing that Noah does, just comes down the mountain a little bit, and what's he do? He makes a sacrifice. All right, he builds an altar, and uh, this is coming down Mount Ararat. I'll show you some of that here in a moment. But what I want you to understand is that he's doing burnt offerings here. And a lot of people think, burnt offerings? Wait a minute, we haven't even gotten to the book of Leviticus. How do they know about burnt offerings? How do they know about clean and unclean? And the answer is this, that Leviticus didn't give us new laws. It took the same laws, and it made a condemnation come if you didn't keep them. It took the laws and it wrote them down as rules on our refrigerator. Whereas what we see here is that Noah from the heart out of thanksgiving wanted to offer offerings to the Lord. And ultimately that's what scripture tells us to do. We should know that God has delivered us from sin, death, and the devil by Jesus Christ dying on that cross and resurrecting from the dead. That is our new life. Just as Noah exited out of that ark, we can exit into this world with a new life because of Jesus Christ. And that salvation, what Christ has done, ought to make us say, Lord, we want to serve you. We want to offer our lives to you. You know, Romans even says that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is our spiritual act of worship. And yet, it seems like so many of us, what we want to do is we say, hey, thanks God for saving us, and now let's go, let's see, let's go build a house here, and oh man, this would be a great place to have a, a house on the lake and a new car, and whatever the case might be. But Noah's first response to salvation is to be obedient and to then out of his heart worship him. And I think that should be ours. There's a lot for us that we could learn from that. That should be our response. Uh, verse 22 is interest, interesting because it says, As long as the earth endures, there will be seasons, days, and nights. Um, there's a time coming when there will no longer be days and nights and seasons. When Jesus comes back, it says in Revelation, There is no sun because the Lamb is its light. And so this is kind of setting, I think, maybe as well, that uh, a different climate, things are different that maybe after Noah's flood than they were before Noah's flood. And so he's saying this is going to be here now until the very end when it comes. Uh, another thing is the curse here. In Genesis chapter 3, we see that the curse of the, the whole world because of sin happened. Well, the promise here where he says, Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Um, well, really, really in verse 21, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said, Never again will I curse the ground because of man. He's taking you back to creation again to remember the fall, to remember the curse. And he's saying, I'm never going to do that again. Now, he's not saying never again is there going to be a curse that's going to come upon the earth. He's simply saying that... Uh, there's not going to be additional curses that are going to be taking place on the earth in the sense of to wipe out everything. And again, it doesn't get rid of the curse of Genesis 3 either. It's just saying, I'm not going to destroy the earth completely ever again. And so this is kind of one of the things that people will say is that this was uh, a destruction of the earth and that the flood of Noah was a second earth that was destroyed. That there was actually a first earth and the very first, you know, I guess empty space of Genesis 1-1. And then God creates a second earth in which it is destroyed. But the first earth is the one that had dinosaurs on it. 
Well, that's ridiculous. First of all, the scriptures don't say that. Second of all, we see that in Revelation, it says that now the first earth passed away. If that earth had been destroyed completely, then it would have to say the second earth. So even here, God doesn't destroy the earth completely. He destroys all of mankind outside of Noah and his family going on the ark. And so uh, it is not a, an absolute destruction. But nonetheless, dinosaurs and things like that would have been buried. And where we get the fossil record and all of our geo geological column, that all happened because of what we've just read here in Noah's flood. Now, coming down that mountain, you would expect Noah then, he's building an altar, that if he landed on Mount Ararat, there should be some evidence of civilizations, you know, coming down Mount Ararat. Well, guess what? We do see that. There is an ancient civilization that has been unexcavated um, in a direct path down the greater Ararat mountain. And we can see, I'm going to zoom in here, that we found an ancient wood carving that seems to be this cave that is there with that stuff. You can see that the rocks in this cave have been removed, uh, probably somebody looking for treasure or whatever the case might be, but the ancient carvings show that there was an animal that was on top of it, kind of an altar, it seems like a sacrifice with priests on either side. Notice the hat there and his legs coming underneath his robe. You can see that here, here's the bottom of his robe, here's one foot, there's the other foot. We see his hat, helmet thing there, his chin. And so this seems to be uh, what's there. And not only does it show that the civilizations were there, but some sort of you know religious roots of it as well. And it looks very biblical in many ways. Another thing is there's this big rock that has these crosses on it. And these crosses are old, very old crosses. They're called pre-Sumerian crosses, the oldest crosses known to man. And what's interesting is there are eight crosses here, two big ones, maybe for a matriarch and a patriarch, and then the others for the children and the wives. Uh, again, speculation, we don't know for sure, but nonetheless, it's interesting. Right in that same area, you have these statue bases. You even have what is called the Tower of Shem that is built there. Now, we don't think this is necessarily Shem's actual tower that he built, but uh, why is it called the Tower of Shem? Kind of interesting. And it is very old, just probably not to the time of Shem. But uh, nonetheless, ancient civilizations in a direct route down the mountain and uh, showing religious aspects to it. There's even uh, inside this, by the house of Shem, they've got these stones that have some writing on them, and it is pre-cuneiform writing. That is the oldest writing known to man. And those that read this kind of stuff say it seems to be talking about water in some way, shape, or form. So, uh, again, uh, I don't know. What, what's the, the, the spiritual application ultimately to this? I think it, it's kind of very fitting that we are doing this message at the close of the Feast of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, the fall festivals are those that point to Christ's second coming. And uh, again, are celebrated even in the New Kingdom as you go read Zechariah. But bottom line is, we have come off of this time of teshuva, they call it, where this a time of repentance. And we see that that's really what the earth needs right now is repentance. Yeah, God's not going to send another flood, but he is going to send fire and brimstone someday again. We need to be repenting and we need to be examining ourselves because uh, this is the ark. The ark is a picture of uh, atonement ultimately. You had to go through that door of Jesus Christ to be saved. The ark brought atonement. It brought forgiveness. And Noah's ark, uh, it, it's really the same word in which we get this word for the ark of the covenant. And that is what on the day of atonement, the high priest would go in and offer sacrifices for this day of atonement. And so there is a connection here. And so I, I think that the message of Noah's flood, if you recall, we talked about this before, that Luke 17 says in regards to Noah's flood, that just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, marrying, being given in marriage right up to the day that Noah entered into the ark. And I think it's important for us to kind of remember that, that what was happening in the days of Noah was the captivity of activity. And I think that that's what's happening in the days of America right now. We are caught up in the captivity of activity, and, and uh, as a result, 
we're truly not seeking a relationship with Jesus. We're not listening to God. We're, we're going about our own lives, building our own kingdom, planting and buying and selling and marrying and being given in marriage, but not repenting, not seeking God. And uh, so I think that's the message of this chapter ultimately for me is to remember that there is a covenant that takes place here. And that is the covenant of the rainbow. And that is really what the Day of Atonement was about, is uh, this covenant God had promised a sign of its fulfillment in the future. And that is what this rainbow, which we'll talk more about in the next chapter, is going to be about, is uh, it is a picture of a covenant that God has made with us. And we should, in thanksgiving, knowing that we have been delivered, knowing that we have been saved, want to offer ourselves, our bodies, as living sacrifices to him. So go and be blessed. Uh, sorry you didn't get to hear the, the full thing, uh, but like I said, it didn't record, so I had to just kind of give you the highlights here. All right, have a great day. God's blessings.